uh, we're ready to go. Here we are, still in Los Angeles. I'm here with Rob Cunningham, founder of Zinix, the Academy of Excellence. Thank you for joining us, Rob. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I want to go into a little bit of background so we know that uh, Rob is someone that we have to appreciate. Robert, I'm calling you Rob. Um, served us, served our country in uh, 30 tours of duty and protected us and our country during Desert Storm and Desert... One tour of duty. One tour of duty. Yeah, yeah. Thir How 30, many thir mi yeah, 34 thir missions? 34 missions. 34 missions. Mm -hmm. So we want to appreciate that and thank you so much for My doing pleasure. that and we appreciate your service. It was an country. honor. It was an honor. Thank you. Let's go. I What we're going to talk about today, we're elevating this conversation. We've been talking uh, for the last couple of days about certain picks and shovels and infrastructure and blockchain and cryptocurrencies and, and uh, certain businesses and what they're building. But I think at this point, we want to elevate this conversation a little bit and talk about what is happening um, globally with this change and adoption of, of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, the whole um, essence of what's happening, right? So we've seen a lot of things that are changing or had the opportunity to change, but it seems like some of these um, motivations are being stymied. And they're stymied by either economic uh, environments or political environments or social, social political environments or cultural, uh, cultural environments. So I'd like to get and elevate this conversation to a little bit of a higher level and take a global view of where we are and where we sit and what the future looks like, if that's okay. Sure. But before we go to that, um, that space, Robert, can you just give us a little bit more of your background, where you've come from, what you do today, and uh, what you hope to achieve in the next, in the next you know, three or four years of, of your career? Sure, we're happy to. Um, uh, George Boy, born and bred, uh, grew up huge football fan, huge athlete. My dad was in the Army. Uh, his brother was in the Army, uh, so military background. Mama was a school teacher. Uh, after military, my dad went to chiropractic college. He built houses. He owned a real estate company. He owned a consulting company. Entrepreneur by trade, if you will. Um, so I got to see a lot of firsthand experimentation and and uh, got to see what it was like to own 35 spec homes when interest rates went to 18% and builders went out of business in the late uh, Carter era days. So uh, went to Georgia, University of Georgia, uh, played football for a couple years, uh, walked on, um, studied uh, management information systems was my undergrad degree. So I really was fascinated with business and computers. and. Uh, as soon as I graduated, I went to the Air Force, seven years of active duty. Uh, uh, the instructor pilot flew Learjet, flew KC-135s in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, after I came back, I worked for Delta Airlines for a couple of years, got furloughed after about two years with about 500 other of my, my uh, recent hires. So I joined Merrill Lynch, became an investment banker. Uh, got really fascinated with the mortgage side of, of, of uh, banking and uh, ended up joining a mortgage company that's headquartered in Atlanta and helped to build out their private mortgage banking division. I was blessed more than anything to meet my wife, Casey, uh, when I was at Merrill Lynch and she was in the mortgage industry. And uh, she is truly the co-founder or the founder founder and is, is, is the CEO of Zenix. I've kind of stepped back from that role quite a bit and been doing a bunch of other things. Uh, I provide advice and counsel when I can, but she's the active uh, CEO of the company. Um, she uh, is, man, talk about a dynamo and a powerhouse. I mean, I married up, I outpunted my coverage, <laughs> whatever analogy you want to use, okay? Um, but, the tour uh, of duty didn't help you. <laughs> it did not. It did not. Um, so for 20 years, you know, we've helped do leadership development and uh, business development and sales and uh, leadership training uh, for you know, mortgage companies in all 50 states across the United States, and so it's been a it's been a blessing to you know have a passion for uh, business development and the philosophy of growing a business and what it's like to act like a CEO and how to go out and build a brand and build a network and build a team, you know, build a reputation and that sort of thing, and and sell at the B2B level because oftentimes our our, our 
clients engage us to help them with their entire sales force or a region of their sales force for a one or two year period of time. So it's a B2B sell because again, we're helping develop the talent that's driving revenue for their organization. So it's been a, an incredible honor and a, a lot of learning on our part. Um, so that, that's a bit about my background. So Zinix, the Academy of Excellence, Zinix is an odd name. How did you come up with that? <laughs> Uh, my wife and I uh, struggled quite a bit. Uh, the advice that we ultimately came to was from a very creative genius to ask us to make up a name that didn't exist in the world. And so, you know, what, she asked us questions like, "What do you want people to say about your company?" And uh, you know, said, "Well, that's easy. You know, excellence, uh, quality, uh, finest." training company you've ever engaged, Ritz-Carlton, Mercedes-Benz. We just wanted people to have a, a associate us with excellence and high standards. And she goes, oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. It begins and ends with excellence. It begins and ends with excellence. But what do we put in the middle? And uh, my wife goes, oh, well, that's easy. My mama was a school teacher. And she said, honey, I don't care what you do, but whatever you do, be the very best at what you do. Be the best. And, and she said, I got it infinite. Through excellence, there are infinite possibilities. So she wanted to put an I-N in between the beginning and the ending with the X. And uh, so we looked it up. The first time we looked it up, it was a Swedish disinfectant company. <laughs> <laughs> so we added an extra N, and it became XINNIX.com, and it was available, and that's how the name came. So it's it wonderful. begins and ends with excellence, and through excellence, there are infinite possibilities. And to that point, we are now a, a global sales and leadership development company for all industries. We're not, we're not just working in the mortgage banking industry. We're, we're, uh, we've got some really great clients in aviation and transportation and manufacturing and all types of industries around the world that we're about four or five months ago, we just we expanded out into the, the world at large and not just a single vertical. So we're real excited. It's really good Casey's taking the helm of that because she's growing the company. She's amazing. She's amazing. She's amazing. Right. Um, okay, this is a good point. So the mortgage industry coming back, coming from the financial industry and the banking background, and as we look at all of those things, it's banking, which is money, mortgage, which is homes, consumer financing, which is ability to live and function in this world that we have. If we look at those three things that we're touching today, which is based on banking and money, and we look at the current environment, which is going through phenomenal change with the development of new technologies such as blockchain, uh, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, et cetera, et cetera, which are all layered on uh, digital assets and digital currencies and the ability to transfer these assets across and make things more efficient. Let's use that as a basis of what does the world look like today? I mean, it seems to me that money is changing and the digital asset in environment is changing and there, there is being driven by agendas that sometimes we have no control of. And this is a hypothesis I have, but what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a, wow, that's an amazing question. And yes, money is changing, but I want to put a caveat on that. We the money system that we've grown up in and lived our entire life has been a money system based on debt. It has been a debt money system, not an asset based system. Very different. To, to put it in perspective, you know, our government schools don't do much about teaching us economics. They don't teach us about money and capitalism and, you know, investing and guns and butter and all those types of things that we, that we just don't get a good general education. If you don't get it at home from a parent or a mentor, you don't go into that profession, a lot of people don't even really know what money is, where it comes from, how it's created, who creates it. You know, to put things in perspective from the time our country was founded, you know, 1776 until 1913, a dollar was a dollar, was a dollar, was a dollar. Inflation was introduced with a whole new concept of money in 1913 when the Federal Reserve came around. So money at that time became what the government said it was. Mm -hmm. And money was debt. 
and then inflation started to happen. Okay, and what was a dollar back in 1913 is now maybe three pennies today because of deflation and debasement. Someone said the other day when I, I listened to a very intriguing podcast that in the 256 years that America has been a nation, half of all the money ever introduced into America has been introduced in the last 24 months. No. 50% of all the money created in America has been introduced in the last 24 months. And that is, it's immoral, it's, it's malpractice, it creates inflation like we're experiencing, it creates a debasement of the currency. When you destroy the currency, money at its essence is trust. Yep. When you destroy and break trust between the government that issues the money or the entity that issues the money and the people that need to try to live off of it and create wealth off of it and invest it and save it and, and have some kind of predictability about what the value of that dollar is gonna be, the last thing they wanna do is see their wealth just disappear before their eyes because the government decided to introduce $8 trillion of new currency into the economy. It, it doesn't serve anybody well to do that. So this, <clears throat> Uh, this is this sounds like a problem because if the U.S. in the last what did you say 24 mm -hmm. months has introduced more money than we've seen in the last 250 years half the half of all the money half of all the money and then we look at obviously geopolitical environments which leads me to believe that maybe China Europe Americas did the very very same thing because otherwise it wouldn't function so if you've got um, the global environment introducing a bunch of money into the system and creating debt, I shudder to think what's going to happen next. Because we've always valued if I had a dollar and I kept that dollar, it would still be worth a dollar when I want to buy something. But now what we're suggesting is that if I have a dollar today, and I'm holding on to it for six months, 12 months, a year, two years, five years, whatever the case is, the purchasing power of that dollar is much, much, much less, which then scares me to hold a dollar. And I'm speaking about a dollar because we're in the US, but I suspect this is the same thing that's happening in other parts of the world. It's the loss of trust about the currency in which the country you live in uh, it, that, that, that is happening. So what right. does this mean? Right. Well, what we have to do is go back as a nation to first principles. And if we have institutions that are untrustworthy or politics trumps uh, the fiduciary responsibility of the government to properly manage and protect the, the value of the currency, then that's where all of a sudden the beauty of decentralized ledger technology. It takes all of this massive amount of power and trust that's placed in a single entity or a single government where the political parties change back and forth or the money and the policies can be weaponized against someone that doesn't agree with someone else. And the money can then be debased or inflated or can be used to finance opposition to a, you're all going to agree with me or I'm going to crimp your money supply. I'm going to sanction you because the world's reserve currency is the U.S. dollar. And by God, if you don't agree with what my political objectives are in country X, Y, and Z, I'm going to cut you off. And that sort of, uh, that sort of paradox has got to be taken out of the hands of men or women that can unfortunately weaponize or politicize the trust that is supposed to do one thing and one thing only and that is provide a currency that stores value and it provides safety and security and the ability for the average citizen in America to build wealth. It's not supposed to be evaporated away like ice but unfortunately since our, our, our current existing system has come about, money has acted like an ice cube and you put the ice cube in your hand and it immediately begins to melt <laughs> slowly. And that's what happens to the dollar. That's why the dollar has gone from a dollar to a nickel or three pennies because it's slowly, inflation is theft. 
Inflation is, a, is an invented construct of those that brought us the debt-based dollar system and what distributed ledger technology and cryptocurrencies, the promise of blockchain and the promise of digital assets is bringing back into fashion is trust, wealth, accountability, and the inability to either weaponize the dollar, weaponize the monetary system, abuse the trust of the issuers of those currencies, and have accountability where people can actually trust the system. They can trust the value of the assets, and they can't, all of that power to abuse or to even just make a mistake isn't concentrated in a single entity, in a single central bank, or in an all-powerful government that controls the world reserve currency. It's decentralized, it's automated, and it's accountable to the people that own the assets. That's what is so brilliant about this space. So it brings up the point of um, a couple of a couple of things that have come up uh, during conversations. It's you have to have a really efficient centralized system to allow a decentralized system to exist. That's a thought. The other thought is the introduction of a CBDC allows more efficient governance of currencies. What are your thoughts on this, do I guess? <laughs> Who's ever bought into or uh, enjoyed hearing the statement, I'm from the government and I'm here to help? I know. <laughs> okay, yeah. right? So the decentralization of my ability to govern myself is really what our nation was founded on. We were founded on, remember, we fought to get away from a central king, a central bank, a central church essential overlords, the kings and the serfs. We wanted the land of the free. We wanted the opportunity to self-govern ourselves, to educate ourselves, to take care of ourselves. We fought over federalism. We didn't even want there to be a central government at all. We almost didn't sign the Constitution because we wanted 50 independent states and no big, okay, they finally compromised, right? All right, we'll have our 50 states. We're gonna each run independently as states but will give a certain amount of delineated specific authority to the federal government. But if it's not actually written down and perfectly delineated to you, central government, it doesn't exist. You can't have it. And so what has happened is that has completely been ripped apart and blown up like a, a, a helium balloon, like a hot air balloon. And the federal government has become this massive one size fits all, we'll fix everything big mother government and they they're basically damaging everything they touch including the money supply system so why would we want to give more power in the form of a digital currency a central bank digital currency and put it in the hands of the very people that put us in this mess in the first yeah, place no, I, I, does yeah. that make any sense no. <laughs> I, guess I heard the same stories like hey if you have a, a, a CBDC controlled environment, guess what happens is the, the government or someone in government decides they don't like you, they shut you down in a nanosecond. The brilliance and the beauty that has got me so excited to want to be an advocate for this industry to the level that I've become is decentralization puts power back in the hands of the people, the family unit, the local community. Decentralization based on cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. All that is is a fancy word for open, transparent software that everyone can see. Now, crypto offers us as Americans and consumers freedom. It offers us the ability to create wealth and hold on to assets and accumulate assets. Crypto is not CBDC. Central bank digital currency is just a digital form of fiat currency. They print it and they make it digital. They throw in some CCP surveillance, social credit score systems. So then if we go outside of an approved area, we say the wrong thing on social media, they cut off, they go in, they just take our fines right out of our digital wallet that they control. CBDC has nothing to do 
with distributed ledger technology and cryptocurrency in the ecosystem that you and I love so much. What we're trying to do is distribute all of that concentrated power and those that have broken trust with us and proven that they have perverted our monetary system for far too long, put it back in the hands of the people, get the trust back into the monetary system and not and, and level the playing field instead of having one big central bank many people don't know this but the central bank the federal reserve is a not federal b there's no reserves it's a privately owned foreign concern no for profit it is not at a part of the federal government as our constitution was written it didn't come into birth until Jekyll Island, the creature from Jekyll Island, the secret confab in 1910, they sprung it out in 1913, made it a law, and all of a sudden we have this debt-based money system that's owned and operated by a foreign entity that's not even American and it's for profit. I, so, didn't, I well, didn't know that. That's true. It's a true statement. Read the book. One of the greatest books ever written is, is The Creature from Jekyll Island. So in secret, these folks met the biggest, wealthiest people on planet Earth to design this monetary system that was debt-based that they would then control and they would run, not our treasury, a foreign-owned company, the central banking system. So what we've got to do is either realize we're going to continue to roll up and let the central banks control policies and politics and media and government and wars and, and industry the world over because they own the money system. Or we're going to decentralize it, put it back to the 200 different sovereign nations around the world, and let each treasury that represents each sovereign nation be accountable to the citizens and let them compete on a global stage through cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technologies and smart contracts and stable coins. But some may be good at making clothes. Some may be good at making cars. Some may be good at making smartphones. Some may be great at exporting wheat and growing. Some may be energy producers. Every nation has something to bring to the table, and every nation ought to be able to compete and contribute to the world on a fair and level playing field. Well, those that have concentrated the power and the wealth that comes from owning the central bank printing presses the world over don't want that to happen. No, no. So herein lies the chaos that we, we want to figure out where things are going in the world, follow the money. Reverse engineer, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, that doesn't, well, why do they do that? Well, there's no logic in that. Maybe it's part of distraction or fear or look over here, you know, the jazz hands, as they like to say, you know, look at this hand, but don't look at what this hand's doing over sure, here. Sure. There's always an ulterior motive. There's a, a lot of people smarter than me that have said two things. All the world's a stage, right? And money makes the world go round. Yeah. And so if you ever want to solve a crime, follow the money. Follow the money. I, I know. So this, I mean, we can go down various opportunities here and lots of conversations, but we have to be on main stage pretty soon. Right, right. <laughs> um, I want to, what would you like to say before we close out? I mean, one or two takeaways that we can share with the audience today, and then we'll have a part two of this podcast uh, at some point in the future. But as we leave our audience thinking about this, um, let's not confuse, and I think, I think this is really important, if we look at CBDCs and central banks and federal environments, that's total control by entities that are working towards a certain end. If we look at decentralization and ledger and allowing people to contribute the best that they can uh, and contributing to the world well-being, that's decentralized. Uh, that's sort of like, for me, a little bit of a huge takeaway today. It's like don't get confused by the hyperbole and, and, uh, and, and noise and uh, just pay attention to the differences that exist. But how would you like to leave this, uh, the message with the audience today? Yeah, I think if people wanted to, if, you're, if this is the first time you're hearing about this whole cryptocurrency or digital ledger technology or, or, or decentralization concept, please know one thing. The, this architectural software that's being built the world over is bringing accountability, it's bringing automation, it's bringing efficiency, it's bringing inclusion, it's bringing trust, and it's bringing wealth back to 
the everyday citizen in every country in the world, who could possibly be against funding or supporting or wanting to learn more about the decentralization of virtue, where people, if I give you a dollar and you give me a dollar, if, if, if however we change value back and forth, anyone to anyone, any currency to any currency, any location to any location, fast, free, secure, fair, recorded, the ledger can't be messed with. The ledger can't be edited. There's not one single write, scribe that's writing down the ledger. It can't be. It, it, it's, it's distributed ledger technology at its finest. And it is coding virtue into the fabric of every nation in the world. Who in the world would want to not accelerate the funding of distributed software that is prevent providing virtue and wealth to every citizen, especially the nations. Look at the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. South Africans, all you need to do is give them a seven-year-old cell phone and an internet connection and they're banked. Yep. They have wealth. They can start a company. They can start a farming entity. They can start a coffee shop, a clothing shop. They have, boom, they have wealth. You don't need an intermediary banker or someone to show up and set up an infrastructure and build buildings and charge fees and rip them off or sell them crappy products or, or whatever it is that they do. We're taking back the responsibility for banking to the individual level. And who wouldn't want to have a level playing field for the individual citizen? Lastly, I would say if, if you don't know anything about this space, and you're listening to this for the first time, visit link2.com. Even if you're not an accredited investor and you don't even know what that means, you can go for free to link2.com. You can sign up with an email address. They have access to data and research and information and podcasts like this one and others. You can begin to educate yourself because one of the wisest things anyone's ever said is that we are enslaved or in, in, uh, we don't have wealth through a lack of knowledge. It's the only thing that imprisons us is what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Be curious. Start learning about what money is. Start learning about how to build wealth. Start learning about this ecosystem. Then you can go out and begin to start to invest and it'll make sense. Don't just emotionally go and invest, but take advantage of the gifts that are given you and the gifts from Link2 to, to be able to go to their website, sign up for free, gain access to research and begin to educate yourselves Trust me, the bankers don't want you knowing what we know. <laughs> they don't. And you've They're come, not you, our friends. And you've come from that industry. You know it. Yes, sir. Uh, Robert Cunningham, uh, <laughs> Zinix, the Academy of Excellence. Thank you so much, sir. It's my I pleasure. You. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Thank you. Appreciate it.